Yeah. So the book is called Flying in the Face of Fear, a Fighter Pilot. Hold lesson. on a second. Did you name the book? Did you name it or did somebody else name it? Uh, I named it in uh, coordination with my publisher. So they. Approved. That's a great fucking name. Well, here's the thing. Uh, I got a lot of feedback that I shouldn't, that I, that I might not want to put fear in the title. And Why? because people think of fear as like weakness or vulnerability. And I think whole, it's exactly what it's supposed to say. Exactly. It's the point that we all face fear at some point, fear, nervousness, worry, doubt. It is all about what you do in the moment that matters. You know, can you step up in the face of fear? Can you act when you're afraid? You know, do you have the courage to do hard things? Hey guys, if you missed out on the last conference in Nashville, Tennessee, you don't want to miss out on the next one. It's April 28th through May 3rd, Orlando, Florida, the Gaylord Palms Resort and Convention Center. You made a mistake missing the last one. You don't want that to happen again on this one. Five days of some of the best training you're ever going to experience packed into one event. We have an early bird special right now, $50 off. Use 24 early bird on our website, streetcop.com. Look for the conference, click the link, register today. If you want to get significantly better at this profession in five days, don't dare miss out on the 2024 Street Cop Conference. Street cop. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino, and we have with us today Kim Campbell. And I'm going to let her, typically, Kim, we let people talk about themselves because I don't want to fuck it up. Uh, Kim is a keynote speaker, best selling author, fighter pilot, combat vet. I don't have your rank in front of me, so I'm sure it was high as fuck by the time you left. Um, but your best bet is, is to start from where you grew up, how you got into the military, the things you experienced, your rank. And this is your opportunity to like, with all humility, do a little fucking peacock in here. So <laughs> have at it. And I appreciate you being here. It's really awesome to have you. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I just recently retired from the Air Force after spending 24 years um, in the Air Force as a fighter pilot uh, and a senior military leader. I, I grew up in San Jose, California, decided at the uh, age of, uh, of 10 that I wanted to be a fighter pilot, that I was gonna go to the Air Force Academy. Keep in that mind, this was 1986, so women weren't allowed to be fighter pilots back then. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, thankfully, the policy changed by the time I graduated high school, uh, went on to the Air Force Academy, and uh, got selected to fly the mighty A-10 Warthog, uh, which supports awesome. ground troops. Spent uh, several deployments to Afghanistan and Iraq, over 100 combat missions, uh, flying missions there in support of our ground troops. Amazing. And then Got the opportunity to lead teams uh, in the Air Force, anywhere from about a small teams to uh, over a thousand military and civilian personnel uh, leading uh, our our airmen, and uh, really enjoyed that opportunity to to lead them. Uh, finished out my career at the Air Force Academy as the director for the Center for Character and Leadership Development, which for me was like life coming full circle, where I got the opportunity to come back where I started. Uh, and help uh, teach this next generation of aviators. So it's been a wild ride. And I'm really enjoying the next chapter. Uh, I've got two boys who are 10 and 14, and I get to spend more time at, uh, with them, not always at home, but uh, you know, with them and uh, super exciting to, to kind of go on this next chapter and uh, to change it up a bit, do some executive coaching, leadership coaching, uh, some keynote speaking, and visit with just teams and corporations and organizations uh, around the world uh, to talk about leadership, which is obviously what I'm passionate about. I'm fucking pumped. <laughs> Good. <laughs> obviously, were you like the first generation of female pilots in the Air Force at that time? There was a there was a, a, a generation, if you will, uh, a couple of years of, of women that came before me. And uh, thankfully, it's always I, I kind of find <laughs> yeah. it nice not to be the first. Uh, you know, they definitely face some challenges and uh, you know figuring things out. Uh, so thankfully, there were some women that came before me. Uh, but when I finished pilot training and went into my very first fighter squadron, I was the only female pilot in the unit. Uh, I certainly put a lot of pressure on myself. I mean, I wanted to perform. I wanted to to fit in with everybody. I wanted to be part of the team. And uh, you know, I, what I found is that credibility and capability was huge. Um, I, I went in. I worked hard. I studied. 
uh, and uh, I could fly the airplane. Uh, and so it turns out that the jet doesn't care. The jet has no idea <laughs> who's flying it. Uh, and it really turns out that the guys in my squadron didn't care about it either. They cared that I was credible and capable. And, uh, you know, they're my brothers. And uh, to this day, um, you know, I, I remember my very first fighter squadron we deployed together right after 9-11, uh, nonstop, multiple times to Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, just, you know, I find that when you go through those hard things together, it definitely brings the team together for sure. Was there a moment where maybe in the beginning you felt like you were an outcast or you had to, you maybe understood that you had to gain the trust of these other quote unquote men, essentially, right? You're the only female there. And going into that, was there a moment that you remember where it you recognize that you are now accepted by them. What was that moment? I think, you know, the moment I walked in, I knew that I was, you know, I was different, obviously. And I think part of it is, I think the guys just, they didn't really know how to act or what they could do or what was acceptable. And so kind of just me working with them and just letting them know I'm just like everybody else. Uh, I remember the first time I flew with one, a, a very senior instructor, uh, in the squadron had been around for a long time, older. And, uh, he looked at me right before the brief and he said, Kim, I've never, I've never flown with a girl before. And I was like, I had to comfort him to say, look, uh, sir, it's actually not going to be all that different. I'm just might sound different on the radio. <laughs> and so it was just, it was awkward. I think more than anything, it was just this awkward unknown of what can we do? What can we say? How do we act? What's okay? What's not. And, uh, I just never really had a problem just telling them like straight up what what worked and what didn't. And uh, I think for me, deploying for the first time, deploying in combat, I definitely, that's where I felt like part of the team. I, I think proving myself in combat and proving that I was a credible, capable pilot when it mattered the most, I think that is... And maybe that was more of me just feeling comfortable. Um, but I I felt like really from the beginning, though, I felt that they were very accepting of me because they saw how hard I worked. They saw how I could perform in the airplane. And in all reality, many of those guys that were in my squadron, I knew from my time at the Air Force Academy or pilot training. So I wasn't a completely unknown entity. Uh, and I think that really helped just having those relationships and friendships uh, before I even walked into the squadron. Do you think you gain more respect? And I, again, I'm not trying to make this a male female thing. Obviously, that's a big conversation of the things that you had to endure at a time when you're some of the newest female pilots in the Air Force and the in the in the armed services. And you know, do you think at a certain point, not only did they accept you, but they almost admired the idea that you made the cut and you were like, they almost put you on a pedestal at some point, like, here she comes. This is our this is our girl here. Like she's a badass motherfucker. I think, you know, um, I didn't really see it that way, I guess. I just felt very much part of the team. But I also felt um, just a sense of like this idea that we would do anything for each other. You know, I know they had my back. You know, they they believed in me. They supported me. Like it was a very welcoming environment. And, um, you know, I think after um, a pretty significant combat mission in Iraq, um, I think they also felt very proud, like that I, you know, that, that I was part of a team. I, I don't know if it was because of my gender. I think it was more of like when someone on your team goes through something difficult and survives, uh, I think you're, I think no matter who you're kind of proud of them and, and happy that they're part of your team. Is there a specific time in your military career that you did face a significant challenge because you were different because you were a different gender? Like, was there a moment that anybody like maybe got out of line with you, crossed the, those boundaries? The only you know? thing I can think about the only time, and it's pre-military, was in middle school when I took wood shop and I was the only girl in my wood shop class and the teacher was older. And I remember asking him about my pencil case. This is, this is the project that we worked on was a wooden pencil case. And I remember asking him before I was going to stain it, like if it was ready or good to be stained, I probably shouldn't have even asked him the question um, looking back because when I said, I was like, Hey, is this, is this good enough? Is it ready to go? And he kind of looked at it and gave me a smile and was like, ah, it's good enough for a girl. And I was like, what the, I didn't even know what to say. I, yeah. I was kind of in the shock moment of like, what, what do you even mean? And I, I don't know what he meant. I have no idea. But in my mind, I was like, you know what? 
I don't ever want to be just good enough at anything, period. Uh, So whether he intended to or not, like he lit this fire in me that was like, average wasn't enough, just good enough wasn't enough. It was always like I wanted to excel and to strive. So I feel like, you know, that happened early in my career. And it really just, I've always kind of taken that rejection and that, um, I don't know, I try to turn the negative into the positive, I guess. I just took it as like, all right, I'll show you. (laughs) Uh, And I feel like that's kind of how I've run my, run my life and my career. Just to give you some comfort, my middle school woodshop teacher was a dick too. So don't feel bad. (laughs) Matter of fact, I was a cop, you know, obviously many years later and he moved over to the high school and I would see this guy as a cop and I'm like, just give me one reason to lock you up, you son of a bitch. Like I I was, I was goofing around, but like, I remember him being in the parking lot because the teacher used to come out. It's chaos. So they would help like direct traffic and like move shit along. And he'd be out there and he's like, one time he's like, hey, they're not wearing seatbelts in this car over here. And I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah. All right. Right. Like, I'm like, I got something else to do. I just didn't want to even give him acknowledgement that I, that I saw him as a human being. Cause he was such a dick. Yeah. He was so hated by everybody. Why would you be a teacher if you were going to be just a dick? I don't know. I remember his name to this day. I won't say it, but um, I won't say mine either. I know him too. He, I, and I've been tempted to like, where is he now? But I'm like, nah, I'm not wasting my time. It's not worth the effort. I don't think about that dude that much. You just happen to prompt or provoke this thought in my mind. Yeah, exactly. Of that, he, that he was there. So obviously this guy gives you a chip on your shoulder. Let me ask you this. Did you always know that you were just different than everybody else? Not in the sense of, we're talking about as a human being. So sometimes I'd be like, maybe I was being corralled into this box that everybody else is being corralled into. And I would just know that I'm just different the way you're talking to me, you can talk to them like that, but I'm just a different kind of human being. I'm not thinking like you're thinking. I'm not in some way, I'm not following these rules. They're silly. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to kind of march to my, the beat of my own drum kind of, was that something similar you felt? Yeah. I think for me, I was so driven at such a young age, you know, fifth grade, deciding what I wanted to do with my life. Um, you know, deciding that I wanted to be a fighter pilot, go to the air force Academy, that that really, you know, that flipped a switch for me. And so I knew what mattered. I knew what was important. I, the stuff that wasn't important was just like, whatever, it's not part of that path. Uh, So I think that is probably what set me aside. And even with my friends, they knew, like, they were like, oh, that's just Kim. Like, that's her thing. That's what she does. Uh, You know, joining Civil Air Patrol in middle school, you know, wearing a uniform, you know, like stuff like that. Like that was just- Yeah, yeah, yeah non-standard. I was also, I also happened to be a cheerleader and played soccer, you know, I just, but I had my military side as well. So, uh, you know, they just, I think from that aspect, like my friends weren't interested in anything to do with the military, but they were like, yep, that's just Kim. That's what she does. And they, they're, you know, fully supportive and and they just knew that that was what I wanted. So I think for me, it was more the driven towards a goal that set me apart more than anything. How'd your parents feel about that at such a young age of you going into the military? You know, my dad was in the Air Force. And so I think, and he had gone to the Air Force Academy. I think there was part of him when I told him that I wanted to do this was like, I'm not sure she's really going to go through with it. And then when he realized that I was serious and that I was really committed towards this goal, I think there was part of him that was like, shit, this is my little girl. What did I just, you know, because he kind of opened me up to this idea of it. And then like, I was serious about it. So I think for him, it was just, okay, now what? Now she's committed. So I'm going to make sure I can do everything that I can in my power to help make sure she's ready. So I, you know, I, I played soccer. I was a a runner. That was no problem for me, but upper body strength was something that I had to work on. And my dad installed a pull-up bar in the bathroom and said, all right, if you want to work on your upper body strength pull-ups every time you go in and out of the bathroom. So I did, you know, and I I worked my way up to be able to do, you know, from not not being able to do a single pull-up to like being able to max the fitness test. And it was just little things like that, that for my dad, I think he was like, well, this is going to be hard for her, but I'm going to make sure she's ready. That's Um, wonderful. That's really, that's really very mature of your father to act that way. And I say that because he was, and we just know that people aren't mature to recognize that this is who your kids are. Yeah. And you can't fight that. And there's nothing I, I don't want to say there's nothing I can't stand more because a lot of things I can't stand, but it's very disheartening when I see somebody 
impose their own anxieties on their children and try to dictate where their kids' lives are going to go and steer them. Like if you're a parent here, my suggestion is be more of an observer and a director and an enabler to the right paths they want to go down. Because no matter what I want my kids to be, like, okay, I'm much more of an entrepreneur these days than I am a cop, uh, but I still bleed very blue in my heart. And so I do the work that I do. But I'm I'm very much into business and entrepreneurship and I enjoy it tremendously. I'm watching my kids. I'm like, which one's it gonna be? Which one's <laughs> gonna take the reins, right? But at the same time, I'm like, it may be none of them. And as long as they're not pieces shit human beings, whatever they say, what they wanna do, I can just give them guidance and instill stuff in them yeah. to help them succeed. I'm not gonna be able to control what makes them happy. I'm not even attempting it. Yeah, I, I mean, I... I realize now what I put my parents through. I mean, as I watch my kids and the things that they have decided that they're interested in, and I, you know, I do my best to support them, but also push them. Like, if this is what you want, then you got to put in the work. You know, it's not just going to happen. And, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's interesting to see it from a, a parenting perspective of probably the the challenges that I um, put my parents through. Um, and and my, I have two boys that are very different. Um, my husband and I were both, um, in the military, we're both a 10 pilots and we've reinforced to our kids. There's absolutely no pressure to go that route. We want them to find something that they love, that they enjoy. Uh, so they're, you know, they're slowly figuring that out. It's, did your kids grow? Do you guys, do you guys still fly? We don't, we, um, we finished out our careers at the Air Force Academy teaching cadets how to fly. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's on the list, but the, apparently the list is, uh, you know, I, I haven't put any time into it yet. Uh, it's just, it's time and effort to go get that all transferred over. And there, and I have to be honest, there is nothing that is going to compare to flying an A-10. Uh, so I have to know that it's just a little bit different in terms of flying. One of our instructors just had his retirement party. I went there. His father-in-law was a, he's a fighter pilot. And, you know, we're in the backyard. He's barbecuing. He's telling me these stories. And he's been, he's been flying jets in the military in the Air Force since like the late 70s. So I think he, I think he flew in, actually, he might have flown in Vietnam all the way through like the Gulf War. And I don't know how long he'd been retired, but I remember him saying something like, once you fly that thing for as long as I did, he flew like F-16s. Yeah. And he's like, I can't get into these fucking planes. And it's just, and he, I forgot what analogy he used, but he's like, you know, it's like going from this to this. It's like going from like riding a souped up motorcycle to riding a tricycle. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it just won't compare. I mean, there's something about flying the A-10 and, you know, you're ripping around at a hundred feet and yeah, the A-10 isn't as yeah. fast as some of the other fighters, but when you're at a hundred feet off the ground and flying through the desert in Arizona, where the cactus look pretty enormous, uh, you know, ripping through the terrain, the valleys, climbing over, uh, the, the hills and, and popping up to shoot targets on the range. And, and then, cool. you know, it just, it's really hard to hop in a Cessna and make it feel the same. I know. That's cool. Actually, a friend of mine, this may sound crazy, who owns a fighter jet. And he was never in the military. He just loves planes. And so I was like, you know, what does it cost you to run that thing? He lives in right north Indianapolis. He's like, it's about 7,000 bucks for two hours. Yeah. And are you serious? He's cheap. like, yeah. Yeah. So he's like, he's like, yeah. He's like, I don't even fill the whole thing up. I just use the regular tanks, not the reserve tanks. Because <laughs> like, because he wants to go as fast as he possibly can. And he's like explaining to me how he gets like to almost a G on it, how he has to maneuver it. And I'm like, he's like, do you want to come for a ride? I'm like, no, I'm, I don't think so, but that's cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Flying in the back seat is not the same as flying in the front seat. I do not fly in the back seat other than when I, you know, I got to fly on the airlines to go somewhere. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not the same. It's all about being in the front seat, controlling the airplane. Are your kids like exposed to flying in planes like that? Did they grow up in planes or? Oh yeah. I mean, they grew up out on the flight line. They get to get in the airplanes. They got to fly in the simulators. And uh, I don't, you know, the the hilarious thing is we would take them to air shows and, you know, the Thunderbird demonstration team would be overhead and they were more enamored with the fire trucks uh, that were there and, (laughs) you know, to climb on the fire trucks and do that. And the, you know, there can be this awesome aerial demonstration going on and they're like hanging out in the fire trucks, you know, wanting to honk the horns. Like, you know, they just, 
I think they didn't really get how good they had it, like how what a cool experience until right about the time we were getting ready to retire. And they were a little bit older now and they were like, wow, this is actually, we get to sit in the, the airplane and we can fly in the simulator and do a mission. And so it, it took them a while. Uh, I don't, I don't think they realized how, what a neat opportunity they had, but you know, it's okay. The different things for different people. Yeah. Listen, I remind me of like when I recently brought my two middle ones to Universal Studios and it's expensive and we're there and they're like, Hey, uh, it's like 10 30 in the morning. We just got there like nine. Right. And they're like, can we go back to the hotel and go in the, in the, in the pool? And I'm like, yeah. guys, like, what are we, <laughs> what are we talking about? Like you're at universal. Like we just got the fast passes. They were like $300 a piece. Yeah. Like, can we just go on rides? Like, all right, fine. For like another hour. I'm like, no, 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 we're staying. <laughs> so that's why, our, that's why our, yeah. don't tell anybody. That's why our kids have not been to Disneyland. So <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. Um, how did you and your husband meet? Uh, we met at the air force Academy. So like, tell me about that a little bit. How we met? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, like, what do you look over at your desk? You're like trying to, you're drawing planes on a paper, uh, you know, doing an, a, you know, a, a multiple choice test. You look over and go, and you like lock eyes and like angels came out. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> no, it wasn't like that at all. Actually, I didn't like him very much when I first got to the Academy. <laughs> he was, uh, he was two years older than me. So he was, uh, you know, a senior, an upperclassman and we generally, you know, they're just, you know, they yell and they're, they're, you know, they're not people you want to hang out with. They, at all. They're dicks. So, they're dicks. Yeah. So I, I didn't really want anything to do with them. Uh, and you know, eventually over time we, as you know, we, well, once I became an upperclassman and, you know, now like. I'm like, oh, okay, he's actually a normal person. So we realized we had a lot in common. We uh, we wrote letters to each other after he graduated because you know that you that's what we did back then is we actually wrote letters uh, to each other and and over time just kind of got to know each other uh, long distance and uh, honestly we were friends first. You know we went skiing together and hung out together and eventually I guess uh, opened up to the idea that that we were going to be more than friends. So not a very exciting story other than the fact that I didn't like him when I first met him. That's pretty funny. I feel like some of the best relationships come out of stories just like that. Yeah. And I hated this. I was told when I first met my wife, uh, I was like, where do I, um, I can't, I, um, well, so essentially the story went, I'll give you the brief version. I'll go right to the point. I like <laughs> leaned over to her and her friend. And I was like, I was playing the, the Dennis Benino, let me buy shots for everybody game. And then include these two to open it. Like, so I'm just like, Shots, shots, shots. I'm going around the bar. I'm like, shots, shots for the bartender. I'm like, you guys want shots? And she's like, go fuck yourself, Dennis. And I said to my friend, Love it Joe, for I sight. Go, yeah. And I go, I said, um, she, yeah, cause I, I was recognizing her. I'm like, I, and I was like, I don't know if she's a friend or foe, dude. Like I recognize this girl. I just don't know where I know her from. And I just was out so much. And I leaned over and I went, well, she's a foe. That's clear. And then I was like, how do you know me? And then she like went into the explanation. I'm like, oh, that's who you are. I don't remember you being this hot. Holy shit. Because I was just floored. I was like, God, who is this? My God, I've seen this girl around. Like, this is like not like some dive bar. These are like Jersey kind of lounge bars. You know, they're not getting 10, 12 people in a night. They're getting 100, 150 people in every night to hang out and party. They have like DJs and shit, right? So like there's a big crowd that comes around. meet a lot of people. And obviously when you're at bars, you're probably drinking pretty heavily. So your memory is kind of fuzzy, but... So similar story there, you know, um, you said you went on over a hundred missions, by the way, I didn't thank you, uh, enough. I, I, we have so many people that were tied to in the military and I, I emphasize this a lot. I have so much compassion. I have so much thankfulness in my heart because I put myself in your shoes of leaving this country and going to live, leave your life and living on the other side of the world that is just completely foreign in every way, shape, and form, completely uncomfortable. People don't realize that, how uncomfortable it is. And, and doing a thing that's so selfless, putting yourself in harm's way, that I think on the surface, they don't really encompass what it means to be deployed and go on. on. So, you know, thank you so much. I want you to know that I really feel, because I put it, I take time to think about that. I take time to envision myself being there, being in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and like what it must be like in the heat. And like, there's no, you know, you hear these stories now that I have, you know, we have friends that are Medal of Honor winners. Um, not, not to brag, just like, <laughs> just like, you know, uh, me, Dakota Meyer, 
and uh, you know Kyle Carpenter. We're friends. Um, I'm just a Coda's birthday the other day. We're just chopping it up a little bit. Anyway, he's a, these guys. You know, they have awesome a real stories. Good, yeah, yeah, Dakota's a good friend of mine. He's a great dude. We really hit it off as friends. Kyle's a fucking fantastic human being. I've never met anybody like him in my life. But I get to hear the stories, like the real stories about it. So I just want to acknowledge what it actually means to go over there. You weren't flying a luxury jet around, enjoying yourself, sipping martinis. Guys, this shit's fucked up, like on every level. So thank you. It was a... Uh... Some of those experiences were better than others. You know, I think for me, like in the early deployments right after 9-11, there was such a strong desire to serve and to be there. And for us in the A-10 community, our whole role is to support the troops on the ground. So if they're there, then we want to be there with them. Uh, And so I think initially, you know, early on, the deployments were like, we were so eager and anxious to go to be there, be a part of it. If, you know, if there was a war, we wanted to be there with the troops on the ground and, and, and do the best that we could for them to help them get home. And, um, you know, that, that sense of service really drove kind of our belief in that deployment. I think it got harder as, uh, as I got older, as I, um, have had several deployments under my belt. I think, uh, for me, I deployed when my son was a year old and that Oof. was just a low point, I guess, in my career in many ways, because I felt like here I am, you know, a mom of a one-year-old and I'm leaving um, for six months and it was torture. Um, He doesn't remember any of it. Uh, I told my husband, I said, all right, here's the deal. I'm leaving for six months. The only thing that I ask is that there are no broken bones when I come back and he's not dropping the F-bomb. That's it. Those are my only things. And honestly, I could have probably got over the broke, broken bones too. So I, you know, I, it was just like, let's just survive this and get through it. Um, and then I also had the, the other side of the story where I was the mom at home where uh, my husband left for a year to go to Afghanistan. I had a one-year-old and a five-year-old. And I'll tell you, that was one of the hardest things I've ever done because I, here I am the mom at home trying to raise two kids, trying to be a leader in the air force, a fighter pilot, trying to do all of these things. And it was a struggle. Uh, and I really gained a different perspective of what it was like on the other side for our families that are at home when they're, um, you know, when their loved ones deploy, both of it's hard. Um, definitely, definitely pushed me to my limits, uh, on both of those occasions for sure. What are you telling yourself when you're feeling? the heavy burden and stress of those moments when you will have to essentially leave a one-year-old for six months that is everything in the world to you yeah and that you like every day i look forward to every moment with my children i don't take any of it for granted so obviously you have a passion in your voice how did you get through that what do you tell yourself uh I'll tell you for like the first month, I was miserable. I mean, I was in Kabul. I was on the ground. I wasn't even flying. I wasn't even with my unit. I was an individual augmentee working on the ground in Kabul. And uh, I was miserable, like at a low, like I just was trying to get through and survive each day. And, you know, back then it's like, you're trying to do a Skype call and it's grainy and the service is terrible. And, you know, most of the time my son was more interested in closing the laptop because that was fun for him. And he didn't, you know, couldn't really hear or recognize me. And it was just heartbreaking. Um, And then I think I just, I kind of hit a point where I was like, I can't do this for six months. Like I cannot be in this low and just be this miserable. And I really just, you know, was like, all right, I'm here. Like, uh, like I got to get over this. I got to do something. And I just really focused on what I was doing. I focused on the job. I focused on the mission. Uh, I focused, you know, I was working 12 hours a day. There wasn't a whole lot of time to do anything else, but you know, I hit the gym regularly. It was like, all right, if I'm here, I'm going to, you know, just try to make the most of it. Um, and eventually, you know, kind of got settled in and realized that what I was doing was important and made a difference. And I think for me, that was kind of just the, the switch of like, I got to just, I can't stay in this low. I mean, I would just, I was just in such a miserable spot of how I was feeling. And I told my husband, I'm like, as soon as I get home, I'm getting out of the air force. Like I was just done. And, uh, and then I got home and I stayed for what 11, no, 13 more years. So, uh, you know, I just, it's in those moments you kind of hit these low points and, and thankfully, you know, I'm doing my best to to be around 
people that were, um, you know, we're all in it together. Everybody there is going through a lot of the same things. So, you know, trying to lean on the people around you, but just make the most of the a shitty situation, quite honestly. You said when you explain that, that the work is important and, you know, this ties back into, I think a lot of times when people are doing selfless work and they realize the importance of it and they realize what they're sacrificing. We think, especially in the first responder field, none of this is really glorious in the sense that people are making a lot of money doing it. Most cops, most, at least at the inception of their career, are starting with a why. Like, why am I here? Why am I going to a six-month academy, five-month academy and getting my teeth kicked in? Mm -hmm. And as crazy as it sounds, in some weird way, it's to be selfless and be available for those who need them. And the job, and even the job that I do, it's very daunting at times, very, yeah. very difficult. I mean, I just left a mediation yesterday on on something, and it's just like, and it's like what, one of the most unfair things I've ever dealt with in my life. And I can't really, I don't know what I'm allowed to say at this point, so I'm going to not just say much about it. And I got to tell you, it makes it so much easier knowing what I get on the other side of things. And you know, I, 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 I'm not comparing my life to yours, but I say this often on the podcast, like I've missed first steps. I've missed teeth being lost. I've missed a lot of moments. I've missed birthdays and family parties. But on the other side of it, I'm like, I've also received messages from people in those classes who went to those training seminars who were like, bro, I'm alive today because of you. Yeah. Like my kids have a dad this Christmas because you came here. Yeah. So well, as, as hard as it is and as much as it breaks my heart, when I am leaving and I have to leave, even for two or three days, whatever it may be, I find a great comfort in knowing that, like, you know, this means a lot more for somebody else than it is that it means for me. Yeah, that makes a difference. I think for me, you know, getting the notes from troops on the ground that are like, you saved our lives today, you know, we wouldn't be here today. Um, I got a note when I came back from a mission in Iraq and I, I wasn't in the squadron at the time, but some ground troops came by our, our building, our ops building. And it, it, they left me a note and it said, thanks for saving our ass over Baghdad today. You know that I still have that note today. I got a note uh, a, a couple months ago, social media is a, kind of an amazing thing from that perspective. And this woman reached out and she said, I wouldn't be here today because my dad was on the ground and you saved his life. Like, that's when it's like, okay, it is hard to miss those first things. It's hard to miss time with your family, but you're right. It's the why it's the passion and the purpose and the service and trying to do things for others that I think that's what's carried me through the tough times is I know why I was doing it. Sometimes it still sucked and I was pretty miserable, but I, I knew the why I knew the purpose and, and I found passion and purpose in that. Um, but it doesn't make it any easier to leave your kids or to leave your spouse. It's just, it's hard. It's a hard life. And, um, but there are, you know, a lot of opportunities and, and satisfying kind of life rewards that come with it. Has that guilt resolved? Have you been able to find comfort in the guilt of having to leave? Oh yeah. I mean, um, I think if the fact that like I got home and my son like immediately, like it was like, I would never left. Right. He didn't really even remember. Um, but I think for me, what I've tried to do is like, I try to make up for the lost time and, and it's kind of a weird way to phrase it, but like, I, I wasn't home for six months, but I really try to make sure that when I am with my kids that, you know, um, that I was fully present, that I was around, uh, you know, and, and now that I'm retired, you know, now I'm like signing up. You, they're like, mom, do you really have to go on this field trip again? I'm like, okay, maybe I guess no. I mean, but I, you know, it's just trying to make the most of the time that I do have with them. And so I don't, I don't feel any guilt over all of it. I knew exactly why I was doing what I was doing at the time. I felt guilty and I felt terrible, but now I, you know, I looking back, um, no, I mean, I, I'm probably a better mom because of those things that I went through because of the experiences that I had. So I've, I guess I have, I'm at peace with the things that I've missed out on. And now I'm just trying to be fully present and make the most of the time that we do have together. Mm, thankful for the experience. It's very yeah. interesting how the most difficult times in our lives end up being the things that we're thankful for the most because it helps us appreciate or help others more. Pretty interesting. It's wild. Yeah, absolutely. And I try to tell people when they're going through shit, I'm like, Hey man, or girl, whatever it may be. I usually say, hey, man, to girls too as well. I do. Yeah. I'm like, hey, yeah, I'm like, you know, as, as difficult as this may be able to see right now, everything's a blessing in disguise. 
you just got to be patient enough to wait to see what it is. And suddenly out of nowhere, you're going to say, thank God I went through that. Thank God that happened to me because I wouldn't be this person I am with that happening to me today. And it's just I, I hard just, in the midst of it, right? It's like miserable yeah. and painful. Why is it me? Why yeah. me? Why am I this person? Why does it have to happen to me? What did I do wrong? Um, and then, you know, it, sometimes that that blessing in disguise shows up, I don't know, you know, a week later, eight months later, four years later, or you may never know what it was. I had a friend of mine who got injured off duty and I said, um, it was a significant injury. It took him off the road for quite a while. and. There were some woes behind it because there was a permanent injury involved. And I said, I know how sad you are, but what if I would have told you I would have known that if you would have went to work the following week, you would have been shot in the head on the side of the road. Maybe this injury saved your life. How do you see it? People would say, how, how is so-and-so feeling? I go, so-and-so acknowledges that he doesn't have cancer. So as bad as it is, there's just always somebody else who's got a little worse than you do. You know, and I think about that a lot too. I'm not trying to say that we... Don't get to acknowledge our pain, but I think that's a little something that helps recognize or maybe, you know, ground your mind on how bad your situation actually is. Even yesterday, yeah. I'm like, hey, there's a guy, there's a guy somewhere right now. Like, you know, it's it's tough to sit in a mediation for for 10 hours trying to get something resolved, especially when you're the guy getting punched in the balls over and over again, over and over fucking bullshit, essentially. And um you know, in my head, I'm like, there's a guy who's got eight hours left on this earth who's the same age as me that would trade place with me in a second. So if this is the fucking worst thing that I have to deal with, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And I think it's the mindset, right? Of like, okay, this this sucks right now, um, but how do I learn from it? How do I move past it? And I think that's a lot of it is, can you can you learn from those hard experiences? And sometimes it takes a while to figure out what it is you're learning from it. You know, the mistakes, the failures, all of those things. I mean, that's one of the things I think in the flying community that we really try to focus on is there are going to be bad things that happen. There are going to be mistakes. We're going to do things wrong, but what do we learn? What do we learn so that we can prevent it for the next person? And, and are we willing to share our mistakes and our lessons so that we can help the next person? I think that's a big part of sharing those stories so that others can learn, others can, you know, survive or get through what you didn't. I think, you know, having that courage to share those things is so important. People appreciate transparency and vulnerability. So Mm -hmm. especially in a moment when they're having difficult times in their life. And I've learned to be very, very open. I think I've always been kind of open to be quite honest with you, but more, more than ever. And I don't fear judgment like I once did. It's yeah. helped me quite a bit. Yeah. I think um, that vulnerability is something that, you know, um, occasionally people are like, well, can I ask you this question or can I talk to you about this? And I'm like, well, if I don't share it, right. If I don't, if I don't share the fact that as a, you know, as the mom at home, when my husband deployed and I'm trying to do all of these things and I am at like at a low of like, how am I going to get through this? Like the struggle I had and just asking for help, like just sharing that, like that will help others know that it is okay to ask for help. And so I think that vulnerability really resonates with people when they know they're not alone. Um, but it almost, it's like, it gives them permission to, to ask for help as well. So I think, you know, that's important, but I, that comes with time. You know, I, I don't think I would have done that 20 years ago. I wasn't so good at that. Um, but you know, now having the benefit of age and experience and the ability to reflect, I realize how important that is to hear from other people. I realize how, significant it was for me to hear those stories from other people. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's why I believe in the power of sharing stories. I don't share this a lot, but I typically don't do a ton of research on any of the guests for a reason, because I don't want to know too much. I like to try to uncover things as I go along and help our audience learn about you as I'm learning about you. And I have some notes. I've gotten some context. So I'm familiar with who you are. And, you know, I, I there's this thing. As soon as you you said you flew A-10s, I know I heard of a story, and it wasn't from the person who was flying an A-10. And I'm curious if you're familiar with this story. And I'd be kind of going to chuckle if it ends up happening to be you. But there's a story about somebody flying an A-10 and uh, supporting troops who were under assault in a valley. Have you heard this story before of a female A-10 pilot? 
And uh, I, I think it might have been, I don't know who was telling the story. It wasn't the, the female pilot who was telling it. It was somebody else. I don't remember where I heard it, but I remember the story distinctly. And it was a very, very hard mission as they were being overtaken by, I don't know if it was Taliban. And the A-10 pilot came in through the fog and made a pass. And I think the whole gist of the story was she wasn't going to make a second pass because it was too dangerous and went and made a second pass anyway. Have you heard the story? Uh uh, I feel like it's parts of a couple different stories, but keep going. <laughs> okay. And I, I just, this is part, I mean, the reason it's a little foggy for me to jog my memory on this is because I remember hearing it. I remember parts of the story. It was that significant. I thought it was where I thought it was amazing. And I don't know if I saw it on Ted talk or where I saw it. Cause I take so much stuff in. I mean, I'm, I'm like an education addict. Like if you could, if you could snort and inject education, this is how I do it all day. It's nuts. I walk around with books in my hand. Like if I'm, I do anything I can with any downtime that I have to continue to grow my mind and hear some of these great things. So I guess there are similar stories like this. I don't know where I heard this, but I forgot how the ending went, but essentially I think believe this person's courage, what the gist was, even though they were being directed or it was so dangerous to fly in this valley, the person was able to save on a selfless mission, everybody else. And I don't recall if that pilot ended up having a detrimental end or I don't recall what it is, but does that story sound familiar in any particular way? And is it you? Um, so, well, the story sounds familiar. I mean, I, um, I've heard a story. I've, I feel like it's kind of a mix of a couple stories. So I, okay. um, I've heard a story of a, a female pilot flying in Afghanistan. And a lot of the story was that, that, uh, people heard a female voice over the radio and that was almost enough just to the eight, the sound of the A-10 and then the a female voice over the radio. I, I thought it was a little bit myth. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, the, I think, I think at the end they said to her, like, why would you do that? And she's like, because those are my people down there. Something like that was like yeah. the story, something like that. Yeah. I, like, why would you put yourself in such jeopardy? And she's like, well, that, those are, those, those are my people down there. So I think what's so familiar to me is I think that is a story of so many A-10 pilots. I mean, the, that those stories are not um, unique in terms of the fact that A-10 pilots will put themselves in positions and put themselves at risk for the troops on the ground. Um, I know of a story of, a, of two pilots flying at night in a valley and just counting to make sure they That's weren't That's it. That's hit. the one. Okay. That's the one. Where? What is that one? That one is uh, probably told by Simon Sinek about uh, that Johnny, is the Simon Johnny Sinek. Bravo. Yes, that's so, exactly where I heard it. I'm a big Sinek not, fan. Not a female pilot, but uh, Simon Sinek tells the story of Johnny Bravo, who's a good friend of mine, who was my weapons officer, who was a mentor for me uh, growing up in the A10 community, and uh, yeah, really difficult mission. And and I think that's that's why you know, that is exactly an example of what A-10 pilots will do for troops on the ground is, uh, you know, they'll put themselves at risk and they'll do things that are hard. Um, you know, my personal experience of, of flying missions over Baghdad, you know, under fire and, you know, making a decision to do a couple passes just to help the troops on the ground out. I mean, that's the difference. We're going to do it. We're going to put ourselves at risk because the troops on the ground need us. How does it make you feel? when you respond, provide support, and your support was the key that kept everybody alive. Like, how does that feel inside to know that, like, tell me about that. that. That's my why, right? That's that's why I chose the A-10. That's why I continued flying the A-10 for so long. I, I never thought I would stay in the military for as long as I did, but I found this passion and purpose and in service to our troops on the ground. And knowing that what you did made a difference. And I think, you know, we spent time at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan and we got to meet the troops that we supported. You know, we got to see them before and after missions. Um, you know, it just, that was my why, my purpose in terms of staying in this airplane, staying in the Air Force as long as I did because of the troops on the ground. I think A-10 pilots, and ground troops have a special bond. I think there's something about our relationship just in terms of our willingness to do whatever it takes because we respect 
the work that they do, the, you know, how the risks that they are in that, you know, that they put themselves in to get the mission done. So I think it's just a mutual respect. Um, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely my why it is my, it's been my purpose, my passion, uh, my absolute reason for being, which was why it was so hard to stop flying the A-10. You know, it's uh, it's hard when you lose what that one thing that's you're so passionate about. Hey guys, follow us on all social media platforms to include Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Facebook group. We have so much information going out every single day and we don't want you to miss out on any of that stuff. So check it out. Go give us a follow. How does it make you feel now when we talk about it? Uh, I get excited, as you can tell. Like I just, I I think uh, I loved, I loved, ab- I I love what I did. I love the mission. I miss it. I miss, I miss the people. I miss the supporting our ground troops. I miss the camaraderie of the fighter squadron. But at some point, you know, that, that does come to an end and you move on to your next chapter in life. And so that's where I'm at now. And, uh, okay. you know, now it's just being passionate about sharing those stories and experiences and the lessons learned along the way. I have like this thing that I tell people, cause I get asked this question a lot. And I don't expect you to have too much context of our company, but it's a pretty decent sized company. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're having impact in the world. Um, essentially my overall goal is to change how the whole fucking thing's done. And I've kind of unlocked some real secrets, but I have a significant pushback because of egos and, and it's not the way it's always been all this bullshit. Right. But I also have a lot of buy-in. Let me just be very clear that I have more buy-in than I do. And I think people, I've shown up enough and had enough progress and enough success, not saying financially or personally, I'm saying in our ability to show why the work we do is so important and saving lives and apprehending criminals and rescuing children and all this stuff that now I get the blessing from most people. Like, if this is what this guy is saying, this is, we're going to follow this. This is, this is going to make sense. But I say this, maybe let me like, you know, how did this progress to where it is now? And I'm like, you know, listen, I thought I was doing a lot of work as a cop on the side of the road, making traffic stops, really catching bad guys in my community and not just small, stupid shit. Obviously, we all started small, stupid shit, but it progressed to really, really notable cases. And, you know, it was, and then I started field training. And when I was field training men and women, I would watch them go out, take the skills that I gave them. And go to now we had three of us on the highway working together. And I remember there was one night that we had to the top of the, the highway where we worked, which is once you get to the top of it, you can pretty much see about, I don't know, maybe about a mile and a half down. And I just saw police lights everywhere. I almost felt like I was looking, I was so proud of what we were doing. It must have been like eight traffic stops at one point together on the same high, both sides of the highway. Because we all worked this one stretch of the highway together. And it wasn't a very long stretch, but it was busy. So I was very proud of that moment. I'm like, man, there's a guy that I, I know that traffic stop. Then there's a guy that I field trained. And that one over there, she's doing the work because she's, I got her convinced that this is the what we're supposed to be doing. And then I had this idea of like, maybe I can teach other police agencies. So then I went from our agency to now expanding to other agencies. You know, then I'm like, I'm one guy on the road. Now I'm training the country. And then it turns into now it's two of us. Now there's 50 plus of us going out and teaching our niche topics. And so people are like, you must be proud of what you're doing. I'm super proud of it, but like, I just don't know where it's going to be next. So, you know, I try to go in my brain of like, where are we headed next? So like, now I'm like, well, if we can do this with police training, maybe we can do this with like nurse training and doctor training and firefighter training and like military training. And we can, we can have impact on that level. So that's, so I understand that why, and I understand as we're moving to our next places in life and our next, I completely understand. So how did you transition from that? Did you decide to write a book first? Did you go on social media? Did you start doing keynotes? Tell me about the progression of your next chapter of your life. Yeah, it was kind of a natural progression and it's a lot, you know, in line of what you're saying. I think there are things that I learned in my career. There are things I learned from some really hard and difficult experiences that I don't really want anybody else to have to go through necessarily. I don't want you to have to fly a fighter jet in combat and get hit by a missile over Baghdad to understand some of the lessons. I want, you know, I want to share the lessons. I want to you to feel and hear and like 
live through what I went through to, to pull the lessons out. And I think, you know, through the course of my career, I've been asked to, to talk to military uh, organizations and then it branched out to some businesses. And I just naturally started sharing the stories and sharing some of the lessons that I learned. And, you know, everybody wants to hear the story and then that, you know, they realize that there, there are so many lessons to go with it too. So it was really a natural progression for me to kind of continue that story uh, my final assignment was at the Air Force Academy. I was an instructor in the military and strategic studies department. And uh, I would share stories in my classroom. And another instructor was sitting in the back listening one day. And he said, you know, Kim, you should put those stories in a book. And I was like, ah, you know, I don't really want to be an author. It wasn't really anything on my list, nothing I had thought about. And uh, And we walked out of the classroom and he said, all right, I'll take your first chapter in a month. And uh, he really just encouraged me and pushed me to write the book. And I joked with my husband a lot that I would write the book, but I wouldn't have the courage to actually publish it. <laughs> he always laughed because he he knew that I would he knew that I would do it uh, eventually. But uh, yeah, it was it really was more of a natural progression of what felt right. I felt like you know here I am a proponent of sharing stories and being vulnerable so that other people can learn. If I'm not going to take my own advice and put it out there. Um, you know, then, then what good it is, is it? So uh, I continue to, to do some speaking to teams and organizations. I wrote the book, um, which matches a lot of what I, what I talk about. And, you know, I think it's the idea of being vulnerable and sharing stories and experiences so that others can learn too. Tell me about the book. Tell me about if somebody reads the book, what they can expect to get out of it. Yeah. So the book is called flying in the face of fear, a fighter. Pilot's hold on, hold on a second. Did you name the book? Did you name it or did somebody else name it? Uh, I named it in uh, coordination with my publisher. So they. Because that's a great fucking name. Well, here's the thing. Uh, I got a lot of feedback that I shouldn't, that I, that I might not want to put fear in the title. And because people think of fear as like weakness or vulnerability. I think it's exactly what it's supposed to say. Exactly. It's the point that we all face fear at some point, fear, nervousness, worry, doubt. It is all about what you do in the moment that matters. You know, can you step up in the face of fear? Can you act when you're afraid? You know, do you have the courage to do hard things? And that, and that's what the book is about. It's about this idea of how do you lead with courage? How do you make the hard choices? How do you make those tough calls? How do you hold people accountable? How do you have the courage to be vulnerable and connect with people on a human level? I mean, that that is what it's about. And I realized that throughout my career, throughout my life, I felt fear many times. Like I, it, you know, whether it's fear of change, fear of failure, fear of not meeting expectations, it's walking up the ramp to start basic training at the Air Force Academy. It's walking into my fighter squadron on day one, knowing I'm going to be the only female. It's leaving for a deployment and leaving a one-year-old behind. It's, you know, being the mom at home while my husband deploys. It's leading more than a thousand military and civilian personnel. In all of those situations, there was some sense of, a fear or doubt or worry that I wouldn't make it, that I wouldn't cut it. Um, and what I've realized is that it's okay to feel that way, but then you have to do something about it. You have to take action. You have to get up and do it even when you're afraid. And so that's that's what the book is about. It is about, you know, sharing those stories and lessons. It is the idea that, you know, um, for younger leaders, new leaders, whether you're a leader of a family or a large team, it's this idea of that we do face fear, doubts, worry, but we have to be able to do something out about it. And these are the lessons on leading with courage. Two kind of like off-topic conversations or questions. What was your rank when you did retire? I left that out, didn't I? <laughs> I was a, I retired as a colonel. I knew you were going to say some shit like that because now I hear a thousand, <laughs> you're leading a thousand people. I'm like, all right, she's not a lieutenant. She's not a captain. And I don't know shit about the military. Like my one of the guys I used to work with, he was a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps. So I was like, all right, like, all right. And people are like, you didn't realize how, like how significant Chuck's rank is at like 38 years old. And I'm like, well, how significant? They're like, dude, it's lieutenant colonel. That's like fucking nuts. And I'm like, yeah, I don't like guys. I don't, I didn't go. Like you all went to the, literally every friend of mine from high school, just the opposite of what you did because we talked about your friends became cops. They went to the military. I took the civil service test. Yeah. And I think it had to do with us being misled because there's not a lot of information in the late nineties on what, what you were supposed to do. And we all believed 
at some sense that the military would lead to a law enforcement career. They all went to the military with the intention of returning to be a cop. And so when guys were coming back, they were 21, 22. I was running into people at the local bars in our town. We have a big town. And, you know, and I'm like, oh, dude, where you been? Like, they're like, oh, I went to the Air Force. I went to the Army. I went to the Marine Corps. I'm like, oh, it's cool. Like, what do you, what's the plan now? Like, I'm going to become a cop. And I'm like, oh, it's fucking amazing. Like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a cop. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like, I just, I didn't, I just took the test at 18. I got hired at 19. It was fucking weird. And they're like, oh, shit. I'm like, yeah, if I, I can do for you. Like, reach out, man. I'd love to help you. But, um, wow, that's certainly admirable. No question about it. The other question I have, which is a little bit of a selfish question is, is there an audio version of the book? There is. Uh, okay, now I'm buying it. I wasn't going to say that before. Yeah. And I don't read. Sh- I have one book right now that I was told I must read and there's not an audio version. And I got to tell you, every day I'm like, you're going to read 50 pages today, Dennis. And I have had the book for five days now and I'm page 60. That's the problem. So I'm buying there's your a, book. I'm going there to There is to an it. audio version and uh, I, I don't read it myself. That's fine. That's um, fine. But I have to tell you, I listened to the audio version um, when it when it first came out. And um, like, as I was listening to it, I mean, I, I know the story <laughs> and my heart is still racing listening to it. I'm like, I know it's coming, but I'm like, my heart's racing. Like I can feel my like blood pressure rising. I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, apparently this is what a good narrator does. They like, they make you live it. And I felt like it was very surreal to me to hear somebody else like tell my story in my voice. Um, but I was like reliving it all over again. So I was, um, I was a little nervous about having somebody else read it, but, um, she did such an excellent job and, in, in in doing it in a way, I mean, that's why we let professionals do what they do. Um, because she just, she, she brought it to life. Um, it was, it was amazing to, to listen to it back. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's kind of exciting to, to hear the audio version. Colonel Kim Campbell, I'm telling you right now, I'm, I'm buying the book. All right. I, I mean, want to hear I'm what not, you think. No BS. I'll, 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 uh, if you're on Instagram, I'll DM you or whatever it may be. Yes. We'll, we'll chop it up. I I'm going to, I'm from Jersey. So you're not going to get some fluff because I don't need anything <laughs> from you. So I won't have to blow smoke up your ass. If it's great, I'll tell you it's great. Um, I'm sure it is because as I'm sitting here talking with you, like, I love it. Like, I, like, I, I, I really wrote down you're an amazing person. And I don't, we, that's not me. I you could, could just tell me if the it. book sucks too. Just, you know, maybe share that privately. <laughs> I think you probably knew that already if it did suck uh, based on the sales. I don't know. What's your reviews on Amazon? Uh, I looked the other day, there were over a hundred five-star reviews, which is, it's, uh, you know, you write a book and you have no idea how it's really going to connect with people. Like you have a hope, you have a goal of what you are trying to reach people and connect with people. But I will tell you, this kind of goes back to the why and the purpose and the stories. Like the number of people that that have just reached out and sent me letters or notes or, you know, DMs about how the book impacted them in some way or made a difference in their life. Like I just, it's heartwarming. It makes, you know, it's the why it's the new why it's the new passion of, um, you know, the importance. And again, it's the power of sharing stories, uh, to ideally help others. I also think that, well, we can acknowledge how people saw our work. I think anybody who is a critic of your work in a negative way doesn't matter knowing that it matters to those who needed to. So, you know, I'm sure that you're aware of that. And I live that like, literally we just three days ago, put billboards up. It's a big blue line billboard with our company logo on the side. And it was done for a reason just to be the company logo. So people would know who it was from but it was an advertisement for the company because our company logo is very distinct. It's very well known in this, in our, in our community uh, nationally. And, you know, I'd like to think somewhat internationally as well. And it said, be proud of what you do. New Jersey backs the blue. This is running all month on like 30 different billboards. And so, you know, some people were so enamored by it and just enjoyed it tremendously. Of course we get people who are commenting on Instagram. And I, I now at this stage of the game, I'm chuckling because one person's like, yeah, real fucking great. Good thing you spent money on that, not equipment for cops. And I'm like, there is nothing you literally for the first time ever. I'm like, there's nothing we can ever do 
that will never be criticized. And once you recognize that no matter what you do, it's going to get criticized. We're not here to try to please everybody. As soon as you realize that, life just gets so much easier. There's nothing I can do to get make everybody happy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, you know, there. That's what I, uh, I tell, especially young leaders. Like, you cannot make everybody happy. You will not make everybody happy if you're doing your job as a leader. And I think, you know, it's still hard. I mean, I'll be honest. Like, it's you know, you you want people to like it. You want to connect with people. But the reality is that not everybody's going to like it. Not everybody's going to connect with it in the way that you hope. And you know, but that's you know the minority it's the when it's all the people that you do connect with and it does matter to you know that's to me you know that's that's the why that's why you do it it's uh you know it it, it does make a difference in people's lives so uh, you know but it's kind of this constant reminder you can't please everybody somebody is going to criticize you in some way in some fashion and uh luckily at this later stage of my life you know it's easier to let it go yeah i just honestly don't spend any time on it and just stay focused on my mission. I just, yep. I just talk about this. I got my hair cut today. So I saw my barber. I'm like, I literally don't fuck with anybody. He's like, why though? And I'm like, cause I just don't have time or energy to give anybody anything who, when there's so many people who are deserving of my time and energy. Yeah. Oh, fuck. I don't give yeah. a fuck. I, I don't talk to half of my family now because I'm just like, I'm not playing these games with you people. I'm not playing these guilt games and this bullshit. Like, I just, if you can't, like, just be happy and, like, try to have compassion and be less judgmental, I can't be around. I don't want to hear it. If I hear that somebody's judgmental, I mean, I'm immediately, like, I, I'm turned off, but I also try to understand where is that coming from? And is it a matter of them being in a painful place? So yeah. I work every day and try to be non judgmental. I really, every situation in my life. Yeah. No, I like the way you look at it in terms of like, there's only, there's only limited time in the day. There's limited time in our lifetime. And so where do you spend your time? Are you going to spend your time on the people that really matter and important um, versus, you know, the people that are just there to make a rude comment? Why spend time energy on them uh, and focus on the people that matter where you can make a difference? Yeah. I think they just deserve your time. I think there's people yeah. who deserve it and people who don't deserve it. I think yeah. everybody matters. Just who deserve and they can go find somebody to grovel with. That's fine. We're just not, I'm not a groveler. I yeah. don't like negativity. I had a conversation with somebody, I think yesterday. Oh, it's uh, somebody's uh, mom. And I said, I can just stop. I can hear your excuse coming down the highway like an 18 wheeler. I can hear your excuse. And she's like, well, What do you mean? I go, What's your next sentence? And she said, But she goes, Yeah, but. And I went, <laughs> And there it is. There is your excuse. You acknowledge what you should be doing. You're not doing it. And you have an excuse of why you're not doing it. This is not something that is unachievable. You're just trying to justify why you're not following up on what you promised yourself you would follow up on. One of the biggest things I've, one of the biggest lessons I've learned as a human being in my adult years, in my 30s, uh, I'm in my 40s now. I'm sure you could tell by my 90s comments. Um, although right. I have to, yeah, I know. I have to admit though, like, I don't know what you're like. This may sound like you're like your your girlfriend right now. Like I don't know what you're doing to look so young, Miss. But you'd have <laughs> never. Nobody, I'm sure, ever guesses your age because you look fucking youthful as shit. Yeah, my uh, my kids. Uh, I think my kids help me stay youthful because I waited. My husband and I waited ten years. We were married ten years before we have kids, so our kids are younger than a lot of a lot of our, uh, our a lot of our friends and. Uh, they keep us on our toes, right? Like we're, we're out skiing double black diamonds with them and Love um, it. constant. Love it. We're out boogie boarding with them last weekend. Like, you know, because we want to be, be around and be a part of that. I feel like why I look youthful is one is the woman I married is almost 10 years. Uh, she's almost nine years younger than me. Number one. So at 30, I was still acting like I was 21. Now at 41 going on 42, I'm still acting like I'm nine. I've now gone back from 21 to nine years old. <laughs> and I'm I'm not kidding you. Like I roll with the neighborhood kids. Like, like you like if you could imagine like the sandlot on the bikes, like rolling them through like their town. Oh, yeah. 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 Like that's me. I'm like rolling <laughs> up. I'm like, go, I'm like sending my I'm like, yo, go ring the doorbell, see if Philip can play. And like their parents come to the door. I'm older than their parents. And I'm like, it's Phil home. And like, we're gonna go play baseball over at the field. And they're like, let me check. And I'm like, all right. And like we hang out outside. Like, I'm like rolling, like 
I'm dabbing the kids in the neighborhood. Like every, like I'm everybody, like the girls, like we all like 12, 11, nine, 10, I'm rolling with these cats. Like that's how I like to spend my time. Yeah, I feel great. Like, honestly, I'll watch (laughs) the other parents like sucking down Coronas and fucking white claws and now these surf sides. Fantastic. No judgment. I am the happiest in the, wherever the kids are. Like, you know, I, 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 I've talked to this on the podcast. I have so many giant toys that when people come to my house with their kids, like we have a big 4th of July party will be next week. I tell people, I'm like, you haven't been to the party yet, right? And they're like, no, I'm like, your kids are never going to leave. And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, you're going to say, I have a 120 foot inflatable slip and slide with a splash pool at the bottom that I custom built. I have a 21 foot inflatable slide for the end of my pool. It's like a carnival ride. And you come flying down this thing into, into the deep end of my pool. And the line for that thing at this, we have 250 people at our house. I had to hire somebody to monitor the line. So I got a 16 year old kid. I love her to death. She's somebody I know's daughter. She left. She's like, what do you want me to do? I'm like, stand here and make sure nobody breaks their neck. So just let one kid up at a time. Maybe sometimes three, if they want to go down in trios, there's no rules here. And uh, this will probably hurt me in the long run. My insurance company gets the first claim, but I carry a lot of insurance at my house. Zorballs, quads, zip lines. Oh, rock I think we're walls. gonna have to. I think we're gonna have to come to your house for a Fourth of July party. Then <laughs> there are people flying in to come to the party. That's how good the party is. I'm not That's kidding awesome. you. I sit there. It's not because it's my party. I sit there in that backyard and go, "This is the best party every year." I'm like that I've ever been to, and I keep. We just ice cream truck comes like everybody like. There's an ice cream truck. I'm like. You can get two Klondike bars. Nobody gives a shit. <laughs> and like that truck's there for so long. And, the, you know, it's not as expensive people think it is. It's a, And people go bonkers. They think we're like, you know, they're in like Beverly Hills at some mysterious ice cream truck. Um, and we have like, dude, it's just so much fun. It's so enjoyable for everybody. It's a, it's a blast. My friend Ray goes, what do you drink? I'm going to bring you alcohol. I go, Ray, I can't drink during these parties. Are you in? Do you realize what it takes to coordinate some shit? Like 250 people in the backyard. Do you know what it's? It's like running a carnival for a day. Yeah. Every year I wake up, it's hot out. I go out. I like staff starts showing up. We start. I've been bagging ice already. I have an ice machine in my basement. I have, I have about 25 bags of ice already bagged up. And like, I just keep doing like four bags a day to two in the morning, two at night. And like, it's a mission. I like, it's nuts. I'll show you pictures. I'll send you pictures when we get it's off. Impressive. This thing. It's impressive. <laughs> it's the one big all out thing that I do. And, and the joy that it brings people. And now that that's like almost my friend Damien's like, dude, this is my year revolves around this fucking party. He's like, I want to let you know, like, I'm so giddy about this. I can't like we went to Disney in May and I had it doesn't even compare to the excitement that I feel coming to the 4th of July at your house. It just brings us all back to our childhood, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like when 4th of July was a blast, the stupid fucking fireworks and, you know, like just dicking off and being reckless. And it's just, there's something very special about having a 4th of July party. Yeah, it's fun. We we go up to my mother-in-law's house and uh, on the lake and there's fireworks. I grew up in California and there were no fireworks other than they were like, uh, you know, you had to go somewhere to watch them because you weren't allowed to to set off your own fireworks. What a sin, Kim. You don't know. I know. I'm, I'm making up for it now. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Did your father, and I don't know, you know, I, I don't want to go into a place where I, I don't belong, but did your father get to see you achieve the rank of colonel? Um, was he there? Well, my my dad is still alive, if that's a, the short Okay, okay. Yeah, I didn't want yeah, to. No, I'm- uh, at the I age don't... where, like, it's not uncommon. No, no, he was, uh, he, I don't think he was there when I actually pinned on the rank um, of colonel, but um, he, um, yeah, I mean, he's still alive. He's been very much a part of my life. He lives a few minutes from our house right now, uh, which is really nice to have my family close by. So, yeah, he got to see me. Re- he was at my retirement uh, ceremony. Um, and, uh, both my parents were there. And so, you know, they, they were such an instrumental part of my life, my career. So it was definitely nice to have them there and be part of it. Did your father express to you how proud he is of you? He does. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, uh, you know, I, I've always wanted to make my dad proud. You know, he's just been this such an 
inspirational part of my life and my journey. Um, so yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's a proud dad. That's for sure. That's amazing because as a parent, now, you know, that I think we'll always be proud of our kids in some yeah. sense. Right. Yeah, Of course. But like, I think that there's probably some proudness that he is of himself as well for raising such a profound contributor to the human race. It's a big deal. It's, you really think it's about a big that. responsibility. You know, like I look at, I'm just, you know, you, you look at your own kids and you're, you hope you're doing things right. You know, you're hoping you're making the right decisions. And I feel like when they were young, I was really, you know, nervous about doing the important things for them when they're young. And now I feel like when they're, they're older, like, I feel like the things that I do can have lifelong <laughs> implications in the way that the way that I treat them and the way that we talk. And so it's just, um, it's a big responsibility to be a parent. And I, I look at my parents and I'm so thankful and grateful for the way that they were, you know, coaches and mentors and parents and teachers and, you know, just all the things that they did for me. So I, uh, you know, I'm grateful and I'm trying to live up to the example that they set. I have shared, shared this before in the past. I'm going to share it again. I tell people like, I'm like, I'm the best parent you're ever going to meet. And like, well, how do you know that? I'm like, because every day I wake up and I have intention and it's always constant on my mind of being the best parent that I possibly can be. And I got to tell you, to extreme discomfort at times that I hide, that I am the best parent there is. And, you know, I, something happened really recently. Oh, I had to leave. I had to go. Or something, or I was, this is like last week. I had something going on. And my daughter said, oh, it's actually the other day. I, I was, I was, we had stuff going on here. I really had to be here for it. And she had just gotten like this tic-tac-toe board. She's three and a half. And I was preparing to leave the, the house. And she went, dad, can you sit down and play tic-tac-toe with me? And I went, yes. Where most parents would have probably said, I can't, I got to go to work. I'm going to be late. I went, yes. I am not willing to trade off those special five minutes. By the way, she had her own rules. If anyone wanted to know that she played <laughs> tic-tac-toe for me. I'm and one sure. every single time. She also has yeah. her own rules with rock, paper, scissors. She tells you what you need to throw first before she throws hers so she can win yeah. every single time. It's pretty good rules. <laughs> so I, I am not willing to trade off that, at least in her eyes, of how she sees her father and ever try to push her off because I think something's more important than my daughter. So my advice to everybody who's listening is, if you are conscientiously and with intention saying to yourself, is this behavior that I'm displaying that of the best parent that I can possibly be? I think at the end, you can say, I never questioned the action that I took, although be it maybe not perfect at times. My intention was always be the best parent that I could possibly be. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, you know, and it's hard. Um, and have I done it perfectly? No. Nobody does. Uh, but pride. You know, I've, I'm trying my best. I'm doing my best. And sometimes we don't get it right. And that's the thing. And you just acknowledge it and learn from it and try to do it better the next time. There's a book that I've been given out. Actually, people are writing into me a lot about this book. So I'm going to say it again on this podcast episode. It's called Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. This has nothing to do with you. However, in this book, what they do shed light on is the perspective of a child and how your kids perceive you. So I think even though you may have had great parents, I did not, um, nor did my wife. And that book meant not only help understand that side of things, which I have a pretty good grasp on at this part of my life, but also I think it was profound in how I, when a situation appears and I have to take action or react or my actions in general, how do my kids see that from their eyes? You know, yeah. what were they, what was their real intention? What am I doing when I act this way? Is it good? Is it bad? So how did it move into keynotes? Tell me about that. Like when's the first time you were asked to speak in the business world? I, did you do a Ted talk yet? Any of that stuff? I've not done a Ted talk. It's, it's on the list. There's a few things on the list, but uh you know, I've been speaking and sharing my story and my experience of uh, flying in combat missions since 2003. 
and it evolved over time. You know, at first it was just military audiences, then it was local business groups and rotary clubs. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as I also became a better speaker and put, you know, understood that it was also about the message and not just about the story and how do you help transform people's thinking. Uh, that to me is where uh, it there was a switch of now, you know, businesses and corporations are looking to learn to find that different perspective, that different spark. I mean, we talk about, you know, learning from failure. We talk about the fighter pilot debrief. Um, I share lessons about, you know, how do you create teams and build strong connections to get through a crisis? Um, yes, these are lessons from combat and from a military experience, but they are transferable to really any team or organization. Uh, it's really just evolved and grown over time. Uh, and, uh, you know, give one speech one one place and ideally you don't suck uh, and uh, you get referrals uh, to other people who've heard and uh, understand the difference that you can make just by sharing the story and connecting with people. Are you putting this stuff on social media? Cause you should. I am. Yes. Okay, good. Do you have a big YouTube following? Where, where are you at? Like where can people find you before we move on? What Instagram? Tell me about that. Yeah. So, um, well, uh, website is the easiest place. Cause then it has links to everything else. And my website is Kim dash KC, uh, dash Campbell. KC is my call sign. It is my initials, but it is also my call sign and it stands for killer chick. Uh, so Sick. Kim dash dash Campbell. Uh, dot com. Uh, and then you can find me same place on LinkedIn, Kim dash Casey dash Campbell. Instagram, Twitter is Casey H A W G 987. The story behind that, Casey, obviously my call sign hog flying the A 10 and 987 is the airplane that I flew over Baghdad back in 2003. Sick. Uh, that sadly had its final flight, but uh, I have a strong connection to that airplane. So, uh, but you can find me out there on that same thing on, uh, on YouTube. It's the problem is Kim Campbell's a very common name. So you got to go with Kim Casey Campbell. Makes sense. I never thought about, I, I'm Dennis Benino. There's a guy in North Jersey. Who's like a 78 year old brain surgeon. That's it. So, you know, That's it's it. not the only one. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't have a mohawk. I do. That's how you discern the two. I don't think he has hair at all. To be quite honest with you. As you go into leadership and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll begin to wrap up here. Were you ever a bad leader? How did you become a good leader or a better leader? And what makes a good leader? Was I ever a bad leader? I think I, when I first took on one of my very first leadership roles, I, this was about a hundred people midpoint of my career. And I thought that, you know, here I was combat proven fighter pilot. I'd been to Iraq and Afghanistan now taking command of a, a squadron and I thought that I had to put out this like tough exterior, right? Like, you know, I have the answers. I know what I'm doing. You know, I, I don't need your help. I don't, you know, I don't need your input or advice. It, it was like this um, idea that I, maybe it was going back to this idea that I felt like I had to prove myself, you know, set the example. And, um, you know, thankfully uh, I'll make a, long story short here at my change of command ceremony, which is the big formal ceremony before we take command. Um, my three-year-old son was sitting in the front row and before, you know, I gave my speech, uh, you know, I'm looking at him and I can tell he's just totally bored, you know, doesn't have any desire to be there. He's sitting next to my husband. And so I just give him kind of that quick little, you know, smile. He ends up standing up and starts walking towards the stage. And I am like, in my mind now freaking out, like, what is he doing? This is a formal ceremony. And my three-year-old son is now standing up and walking towards the stage. And I'm really worried about what my team is thinking. And, you know, I'm supposed to take command of 150 people and can't control my three-year-old son. My son doesn't care about any of this. I mean, like he's moving pretty small, slowly, like thinks he's invisible and uh, ends up coming right up on stage and sitting in my lap in the middle of this very formal ceremony. But there was something about that moment as I, you know, I'm nervous about what my team is thinking. I'm worried about what people are thinking of me. You know, here I'm supposed to be this tough combat proven fighter pilot, going to take command of a squadron. And I've got my three-year-old son sitting in my lap. But it was this realization in that moment of like, you know what? This is me, right? I'm a mom. I'm a fighter pilot. I'm a wife. I'm a leader. I am all of these things. 
And that's the human side of leadership. It's this idea that we can be strong, but we can also be compassionate at the same time. You know, we can be tough, really tough and expect a lot. We can also be kind. And I feel like that moment for me flipped a switch in some ways, because after the ceremony, when I walked around to talk to my team, the one thing that they all cared about, the one thing that was the highlight of the ceremony was my son getting up in my lap because it made me human, right? It made me authentic authentic and relatable. I just combined those two words, uh, authentic and relatable. And that was the highlight. And I realized in that moment that that's really what my team wanted. They wanted me to be true to who I was. They wanted me to be able to connect with them on a human level. Yes, hold standards, be credible, be accountable, uh, but also connect with people. So I would say that experience, I had in my mind what I thought a good leader should be. It was wrong. And I took that. And then as I went on to lead larger teams, I really understood the importance of building trust, creating connections, and then, you know, still towing the line and holding people accountable. Uh, It was the balance. Um, And I think that's what makes a good leader. That was an amazing story. As short as it was, that was, (laughs) that was, that was awesome. Like I was pumped. Like this is my shit. So like I was pumped about that. I knew exactly where it was going. I'm like, this is so cool. What a great moment. Yeah. And the fact that I learned it from my three-year-old, right? Like it's just, you know, it, it, they bring you down to, you know, to this, the truth of who you are in this really authentic level. And, uh, you know, it just, it sunk in for me and it connected with me in this idea of what, what really connected with my team and what they cared about most. Here's my last question. I've asked this question before, but I'm curious what your answer is going to be. If we went to those who worked underneath you, quote unquote, subordinates, and asked them what they thought about you, what do you think they would say? Um, I think um, a little bit of what I just said. I think, um, you know, I was, I think. I think one of the things that I have, when I've gone back and I have still connected with a lot of the people that, um, that I've served with over the years and, you know, nicely now that I'm retired and not in their chain of command, they're happy to get, you know, share a little bit more feedback, um, with me. And some of the things that I heard from people, you know, as I, especially when I asked the question in terms of what they think makes a good leader, I think one of the things that I heard from people was that they appreciated that I was willing to stand up for them that mm-hmm. I was willing to make some hard calls and make tough decisions where maybe some other um, leaders were waffled or were waiting for more information and never made a decision. Like I was willing to make those hard calls, those tough choices, make the decisions. But I also think that they saw the 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 honest and truthful and authentic connection that I really tried to have with my airmen, not just the senior leaders that, that, you know, at the top uh, of the organization, but down to the lowest airmen. I really, I really tried to connect with them and learn about them and find out where they struggled and, you know, what was important to them. Um, You know, and I, I thankfully have gotten some of the feedback that they saw that they recognize that that's what I was trying to do. You know, I'm, I'm not one to say that I always got it right. Um, but my intention, if you will, uh, I think was was there. Uh, and I think people recognize that. I feel like when you break a stigma, you become a unicorn. <laughs> yeah. Think about it, right? Who do we who do we appreciate the most in life is somebody that we anticipate is gonna be this, you know, especially like you know, sometimes females feel like they have something to prove. Yeah. So on top of everything else, uh, egotistical, especially I hear a lot of things about the military, like, you know what the rank structure and how the obedience and like how it's the misbehavior and this, the ridiculousness. I see this in law enforcement as well uh, because of the uh, the paramilitary rank structure. And I think everybody gets drawn to the person they know that they can trust. And I think that encompasses a lot of, a lot of things to trust, to know that they're going to have compassion, trust to know that they're going to stand up for them. Trust to know they're not going to fold like a cheap fucking chair under some pressure. Um, Trust that they're going to make decisions, uh, even if it means detriment to themselves. So they're selfless decisions. Uh, and and it's hard to do in the moment, but you're pretty thankful after it's after you've done it because that's the stuff that people admire the most. Yeah. 
yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not easy uh, it, by any Oof. means, but again, it comes back to, do you have the courage to do the hard things? It's a big one, man. That's very, very hard to do because it's very scary. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta step out. You gotta breathe. You gotta remove emotion and just try to see it a little bit further down the road of what it looks like if you decide to do a or B and what the consequences are in either one, you gotta be okay with that. Yeah. And you know, I have, for me, I'm not perfect. I have certainly become a new and improved person almost every single day, but I would say, I would arguably say in my thirties. Um, and whatever I do, right, wrong, or indifferent, it's always met with good intention. It's never, it's never done with, with me being the center focus of how much can I get out of this. And, and when you can begin to unpack that, and understand it. If I had four hours to explain it, you would go, that's, that's what it is. It doesn't look that way sometimes, but you know, and some people really know that some people really know one thing that's happening to me a lot now, and it's not about me, but I just use this as an example is that uh, almost daily I'm hearing from somebody that maybe I don't typically talk to or somebody that is works with us or has some connection to us. And now is reminding me of the things that I did for them. And I'm like, yeah, I remember like, yeah, but that was really like, I don't forget those things that you did for me. It happened like five times yesterday. And like, I had like five phone calls. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to do that because like, remember that time you did that thing for my daughter and like it meant a lot. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I did do that for your daughter. And I'm like, yeah, but I didn't do it for the person. Like, no, no, but I'll never forget that. And like, you didn't have to do that and you did it. And I know you didn't have to. And I appreciate that. And like, I just want to try to return the favor. I'm like, yeah, but I didn't do it for favors. Like, not. And that's even more why I want to do it. Cause, and so, I've built up this collection where you may not like me. You may not like the way that I speak. You may not like the way that I do things, but you will never find a story of me being a piece of shit and being self-interested. I promise you that. I just know that. And I challenge you to try to find a story like that. And if you can say that, everything else is, is going to be just fine. You're just not going to find that. I mean, I'm, I've misbehaved at times in the sense of like, eh, I wasn't so proud of that one, but that was a human error. That wasn't something like a, like a, I don't know, a thought with malice, right? Yeah. Could have been like more of a negligence or an unbeknownst, but nothing ever intentional. My intentions are always there. And I think that's where I can hang my head comfortably. Yeah, absolutely. All about intention. Kim, did we miss anything today? Because this was great. I had so much fun talking to you. I find you to be um, a comfort in the world where I like to live and knowing that other people live there with me in the same mindset with the same intention. Uh, and it's really been a pleasure to meet you. And I, I hope that we can be friends. Yeah, and absolutely. You don't have to talk all the time, but you can call me a friend and I'd like to call you a friend. And only if we, only if we get invited to your fourth of July party. <laughs> well, listen, it was it really was uh you made my day today. I want to let you know that. And it was keep up the great work and keep spreading the message. It's great. I'm buying the book. I promise you I'm buying the book. <laughs> thank you. I, I don't well, just say that yet. You'll know. All right. Thank you for a great conversation. And uh, if you ever need anything from us, we're we're always here for you. Thanks for doing absolutely. the podcast. It was awesome. Absolutely. Thanks so much. So the date is August 16th, 2002. And flying over a valley in Afghanistan are two A-10 warthogs. An A-10 is a heavily armored, low-flying, slow aircraft designed to provide ground cover for troops on the ground. And on this night, it's a very, very cloudy night. The storm's in the area. And these two planes hanging up above, just waiting in case anybody down below needs help. Up there, it's gorgeous. The moon is, is bright. There's thousands of stars in the sky. The clouds look like the snow had just fallen. Down below in the valley, however, there were 22 special forces, special operations forces, troops, trying to make their way through the country, and they could feel that something was wrong. They could feel, they felt uneasy. One of the pilots up above call signed Johnny Bravo, and yes, he stands like this. 
he could feel their unease listening to them over the radio, so he decides he was going to go down below the cloud and just have a look. He tells his wingman, hang out up here. I'll go see what there is. And he points his plane down into the clouds. And as he's going through the clouds, the call comes over the radio. Troops in contact. Troops in contact is what they say when they come under effective fire. It means they're in trouble. So now Johnny Bravo points his plane straight down. The plane's getting thrashed about in the turbulence. And when he comes out below the clouds, he's less than 1,000 feet off the ground, and he's flying in a valley, cliffs on both sides. Now, this is only 2002, and the planes were not yet equipped with ground-hugging radar. And worse, they were using old Russian maps. That's all they had at the time. And the sight that greets him is something like he's never seen before, not in training and not in the movies. He sees tracer fire, fire coming from all sides of the valley, pointed right in the middle where the American forces are. And so he picks a point and starts to lay down suppressing fire. And he's flying, and he's in danger of hitting the cliff, of course. He knows his speed, he knows his distance from the map, and he literally counts out loud while he lays down the suppressing fire. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. Pulls hard on the stick, pulls back up into the cloud, comes down around again. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000. Good hits, good hits, it says over his radio. And again, he comes around. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. He runs out of ammunition. Fuel is fine. Flies back up to the top of the cloud, tells his wingman, you need to get down there. His wingman isn't sure about the conditions, so the two of them fly back down together. His wingman lays down the suppressing fire, and Johnny Bravo counts as they fly three feet apart from each other, wing to wing. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, up and around again. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000. That night, 22 Americans went home alive with zero casualties. My question is, is where do people like Johnny Bravo come from? Who are they? Who would risk their lives for others so that may, they may survive? I asked Johnny Bravo. I asked him, why, why would you do it? Why would you risk your life so that others may survive? And he gave me the same answer that everybody in his position gives, because they would have done it for me. Now, if you think about it, in the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may gain. In business, we give bonuses to people who are willing to sacrifice others so that we may gain. We have it backwards. Wouldn't you like to work in an organization in which you have the absolute confidence, the absolute knowledge that other people that you may or may not know who work in the same organization as you would be willing to sacrifice themselves so that you may survive? And, in, and I'm not talking about giving your life. I mean, we don't even like to give up credit. You know?